Hello friendos, what up, welcome back. Uh, I didn't think I'd be making another Caspian Chronicles of Valeria video for quite a while, as I only made one a couple days ago, and that's usually a once per quarter, you know, very sweet treat. Uh, but then somebody messaged me and I checked out the post. Caspian was talking about releasing his financials. Now, obviously this has been brought up before, uh, and that was the point I brought up in the other video that if he did say he was going to do it, why doesn't he just do it? I don't know if people have been hounding him for this in his DMs or whatever, because obviously there's no public discourse what, whatsoever since that all got closed uh, after he shuttered the studio, but didn't really, allegedly. Or whether he watched my video. Maybe he does. Maybe he's a big fan. I'm personally a big fan of him. Um, but basically, right after I posted that video, or maybe, uh, you know, a day later or something, he started talking about releasing the finances. Now, there is a problem with this in that this is not a, uh, you know, third party fully audited uh, financials or whatever. This is not an accountant going in, looking at his books completely for the beginning till the end and then releasing it with his permission and saying, you know, based on our reputation, this is all factually true and us being able to check it. It's just Caspian uh, posting whatever he wants um, and stuff that you would obviously want to know as it is your money, not his, because the public essentially gave him all this money. Uh, so being secretive about how it's spent, to me personally, is a little bit, you know, off-putting. Uh, but we're going to go through it anyway and we'll see. Maybe, maybe there's some hidden gems in here, uh, some really interesting tidbits. So welcome to the third in my new series of developer journals. Uh, these developer journals aren't about Chronicles of Valeria or Kingdoms of Valeria. Instead, they're about me. They're about Soulbound Studios and myself, uh, the challenges and struggles we have faced and the lessons we have learned. So unlike the COE development updates, which are intended for backers and community members, these developer journals are primarily targeted at anyone interested in the game industry or running a business. Yeah. I said this in the last video, but I guess maybe you can impart some wisdom on people of someone who abjectly failed uh, and basically repaid none of the trust that people placed on you or the eight million odd dollars that they gave to you to make something and then just haven't. But then again, since I did bring up obviously the financials and then we're getting, you know, some of the financials. If I bring up repeatedly again, Caspian, why don't you let people play the game that you've apparently spent, you know, six years developing or whatever, maybe he'll let somebody and then maybe we'll see what he actually made over that, that time and where those $8 million actually went in terms of a product. Uh, I'll bring that up every video. I have done now for about a year and a half and, you know, still nobody's seen any of the gameplay or touched the game or he's not loaded up a live stream and showed anyone the game. But maybe one day we'll get there, you know, eventually. So most most topics will be about leadership, funding, financing, company culture, etc. Uh, of course, I occasionally do a deep dive into technical jargon when the mood strikes. Love those personally. Completely avoid them, of course. In the last month's developer journal, I did a reasonably thorough review of the learnings and struggles I've experienced in the previous three years since letting go of the majority of our development team and communicating to our backers that we were temporarily suspending development while we found a new path forward that didn't involve crowdfunding. If that interests you, check out the link above. Was this the one we went through where he just talks about books? Yeah, this is the one where Caspian said he doesn't give a fuck anymore and then talked about reading loads of books. Uh, which is fantastic, really. I don't remember him in that, but maybe I skipped it, talking about, um, you know, when he accidentally said he was shuttering the studio and then said he wasn't, and that was uh, something he said by accident. But who knows? Uh, in this month's blog, though, he's wanted to give current and future business owners, particularly game developers, an understanding of the actual and hidden costs of running a small game studio, average 17 employees, very few such breakdowns exist, so I hope this proves to be a valuable resource for others. If you run a business or game studio and find this information helpful, don't hesitate to contact me on Discord under the name Caspian, via email at blah 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 or via LinkedIn. While Soulbound Studios is always run on the lean side, I'd love to hear whether these numbers coincide with your experience. I'm also interested in hearing ways I can better utilize our cash flow in the future. Let's get to it. You've, you've got no cash flow, mate. So... I, I don't really know what to tell you about that one, personally. 
So terminology, standard terms used in accounting, uh, all mean slightly different yet related things. My goal is for this blog to be something, to do something other than require a degree in accounting to get value from it. So please allow me to simplify things a bit. Costs, asset, expense, expenditure. Oh my. Uh, while the above terms have different meanings in accounting, primarily based on the payment schedule or whether an asset has been consumed, this blog post shows the cost of running a, a game studio on average, uh, including capital expenses when necessary to support employees. For this blog post, I'm not going to bother with semantics. I'll be using the generic term costs and expenses interchangeably to mean any money that was paid by Soulbound Studios over the three years from 2017 till 2019, regardless of whether it was for goods, services, or taxes, fixed or recurring payments with or without long-term depreciable uh, value. If Soulbound spent money, it was a cost or expense for the purpose of this blog post. I wonder why he's doing it from 2017 until 2019 when obviously the company had money from people for longer than that and the studio didn't even close until 2020. It's a little bit weird to leave that off, especially considering some of the points that people brought up, completely valid points, by the way, and something I'd love to see addressed, is that Caspian ran a crowdfunding uh, for, for Chronicles of Valeria the game, like... Uh, it, was, it was like 10 days or something before saying, you know, we've run out of money, we're closing up shop. And I'm fairly sure those people who, who put money in during that crowdfunding event did not receive a refund. Nobody's told me they have, so maybe they have, maybe I'm talking at my arse, uh, but I've not seen anybody say that they got refunded uh, during that period if they did give money, which is kind of odd because where does that money go then? Because obviously at the time, uh, he said, we've run out of money, we're closing the studio, everybody's been fired, I've had to let them all go, it sucks. This all verifiably happened. He even said on Twitter that he shuttered the studio, which obviously everybody who understands English knows that means it's closed. When you shutter something, it's closed. Uh, and then he came out and said, as, you know, as soon as people start threatening him uh, with lawsuits, hopefully not the other kind of threats, he said, oh, that was a misspeak and we didn't do that. And it's actually opening, I'm working on it on my own and the game isn't going into the abyss uh, which is literally what he titled the blog which anybody again who understands english knows exactly what that typically would mean so i'd always want to know obviously where did the money go uh, and where was it intended to go when people gave it uh, when you were shuttering the studio at the time but obviously he's used it since then to probably pay towards the fact that people brought a class action lawsuit to him or to pay for the one or two employees he retained uh, while trying to make Kingdoms of Valyria, which hasn't seemed to have materialized in any meaningful way either. So generally speaking, money comes out of a corporate account for three reasons. One, to pay taxes. Two, to make post-tax payments to vendors, suppliers, employees, uh, service providers, shareholders, dividends, etc. Uh, and to make pre-tax payments slash withdrawals to members of, or shareholders, also called distributions. Category one is all the costs you pay to the government for doing business. Category two is all your payments to others for running and operating the business. And category three is all the cash you pay to yourselves for owning the business. I've included all three categories in the tables below. This is the one of paying yourselves for owning the business is the one that obviously people were quite upset about and thinking Caspian took all $8 million himself and he's just been doing loads of nose candy all the time, just load, just copious amounts of sniff, um, which obviously that's partially a joke for legal reasons. Uh, but obviously people have been saying he ran away with 8 mil, which I've said multiple times is ridiculous. It just didn't happen factually. People did work there. Money was spent. It was just spent on, you know, not making a game very well but they did try to make one. So while I could have just used averages or approximations for this blog, uh, for this blog post and achieved the same result, I did decided to pull the information for this blog post directly from Soulbound Studios, P&Ls, Profit and Loss Statements, for the, for the years of 2017 to 2019. The below information is 100% uh, reconcilable with our bank records. That being said, I didn't want to do an exhaustive breakdown of categories, nor could I provide a detailed analysis of payments. So instead, the table below shows the high-level spending categories and their associated costs as averages over the three years. Below that, I'll provide descriptions with examples of the types of payments that fall into each category. So reasons for averages, if you're still curious why I didn't do a detailed category, uh, categorical breakdown or show the amounts paid by vendor or employee, employee, allow me to explain. NDAs, 
yeah, this makes some sense. So first, whenever you sign a negotiated agreement with third parties, there often, it often is an NDA. So the third party can maintain its competitive advantage in other negotiations. If you got a good deal, they don't want others to know what kind of deal they are willing to make. And if you didn't get a good deal, they want you to refrain from asking around and becoming more aggressive in the negotiation. It's the same reason many companies don't allow you to share your salary information with others. Uh, we didn't have that policy. It's a, The last part is obviously a problem in the world in general. Everybody should know what everybody's making in, in the same workforce. So you know if you're getting fucked uh, or your mate you know, knows whether they're getting fucked because employers will just fuck you if they can uh, and always will do. And you shouldn't be doing any favors to any corporations that you're working for or you know millionaires that are running medium-sized businesses because they wouldn't do you any favors they probably wouldn't piss on you if you're on fire generally so pll and privacy second to offer insight into how much salaries can run you on average to run a small game studios it's irrelevant how much each individual made i disagree uh, as somebody who again he's presenting this as these financials are to help other game developers which I'm not even trying to be a dickhead when I say this, but obviously I wouldn't ever want advice from somebody who who abjectly failed at doing something uh, apart from, you know, what not to do because I don't want to see your averages and, and all the things that are not specifics um, for something that didn't materialize and didn't do well uh, because obviously you fucked it up. So only the failures are going to help me in any way to understand what not to do obviously when presenting it as being this is going to be helpful for other game developers and people who want to run a studio and things like that almost none of those people are going to care nor will it be super useful i'd imagine maybe it will be maybe i'm wrong uh, what people do care about is knowing who made what uh, specifically what you made oh that being said i'm happy i'm more than happy to share my salary information in the deep details below so forget all that as long as he shares his so keeping the goal in focus the goal of this blog is it isn't to try and rationalize soulbound studio spending or validate our transactions the goal is to provide a resource for others that helps them better understand the types of costs they'll face when running a game studio both actual and hidden yeah we read this already so here we go why is he done 2017 to 2019 so although Soulbound Studios was incorporated and operational in 2015 and has continued to do business since then, I've opted to keep the focus on this blog post on just the years 2017 to 2019 and here's why. In 2015, the studio consisted of myself, who wasn't receiving a salary, and two part-time independent contractors making below industry standards. Including 2015 in the average would unnecessarily bring down the norms and paint an inaccurate picture of the ongoing operating costs. You still should have done it, but just not done averages for the whole thing. It should literally have just been uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. Uh, this is the cost of all the things, This, which he's literally done here, but he's done per year uh, instead of just doing, just showing each year. The averages are, are useless to anybody who actually cares about seeing this. Because obviously when people say, show us the financials, they don't mean just show us numbers of what, you know, he could have shown us a, a, an Excel sheet that had one cell that said money in and one cell that said money out and then gone, yep, there's our financials, you know, that money came in, that money went out, there you go. This is obviously a little bit more useful, but it's not as useful as being able to see per year uh, what was going on from the beginning to the end which is exactly what people wanted. This is kind of like a, this is kind of just half arsed in my opinion, but you know, maybe somebody will get something from it. Maybe I will. So in 2020 to 2023, the studio has been operating with a skeleton crew, ranging from five individuals to just one. And throughout that period, I haven't drawn a salary. As with 2015 to 2016, this would dramatically bring down the averages. What about the legal costs though? Where's that come from? Surely, I guess he's been paying them himself. Uh, so again in 2016 as well they were building the studio had fewer than the average employees from 2017 to 2019 and i wasn't taking a salary until about three quarters through the year so again including 2016 would bring down the averages and paint an unrealistic picture i won't repeat my point so the vast majority of costs throughout 2020 and 2023 have been legal fees that are neither representative of the previous three years from 2017 to 19 nor are indicative of the average expenses for indie developers or small game studios i hope same yeah, same. So the above chart shows the total spending by category over the three years 
from 2017 to 19 on the left uh, and the averages per year on the right the left column is sorted alphabetically and the right column is sorted in order of the most significant cost to least so per year from 2017 to 2019 they were spending on average 1.16 million dollars um for i believe he said 17 to 20 employees let's just go 18 let's meet in the middle so on average sixty four thousand dollar salary which is not a lot uh obviously some people would have been on less some people would have been on more uh, i don't know how this makes sense d due to the area they're operating in uh, maybe this is a reason why they couldn't attract a, a lead programmer that was you know amazing somebody to actually put their stamp on the game and do really well because nobody's coming to, you know in that area to work for less than you know 150 grand or something uh, to be a lead on on a game studio next up is employment taxes uh, health insurance premium software licenses 113 grand a year on software licenses office lease is 100 grand a year which again they decided to lease an office in an incredibly expensive area which obviously if you're making a game in 2023 the best advice would probably be to just do it remotely i've seen so many indie studios now uh running games remotely and doing perfectly well as well as i've seen so many that decide to get some crowdfunding in first thing they do to like go legit or whatever and make themselves feel great is to rent an office and then they are obviously pinned down uh, by the sunk cost of we need everyone to be here so we can't hire people overseas that would probably fit the role or have them living somewhere else and, and maybe pay them less so they don't have to get a, a house in the area which is probably expensive or commuting and things like that and then it just fucks them up real bad so it so works for some doesn't work for others but probably something to look into if you are uh, an indie studio owner distribution so that's 77 grand on top that went to the owners uh, which i assume isn't involved in uh, maybe he's not including his own salary in there maybe he'll he'll let us know loan payments loans for what doesn't say hosting and registration fees independent contractor fee 39 grand for hosting and registration per year it's fucking madness independent contractor fees so i guess that's in addition to the employee uh what you'd class as basically just paying people state licenses and taxes convention costs love going to conventions for a game that nobody ever played professional service fees marketing and smm uh, software advertising advertising what uh, production software office expenses business and office software i don't know why these aren't in the software licenses that he, he brought up hiring expenses education and training internet mate how good was their internet six thousand two hundred seventy eight dollars per year for internet wow uh, pc hardware five grand travel 3.8 food and entertainment secure storage space payroll processing fees customer support software general liability insurance banking fees research 471 dollars per year research doing what furniture 181 dollars just one chair from ikea so commentary and breakdown by category uh, advertising Soulborn Studio has paid a total of just over thirty-four thousand dollars from 2017 to 2019 that's an average of 11.5k per year primarily primarily including promoted sponsored posts on social media sites like facebook and twitter it also includes to a much lesser degree some swag and items we created as giveaways like stickers t-shirts etc make these are like fucking limited edition now i bet these if you put one of these up on ebay one of the counts who spent 10k on a on a plot of land they'll never use in a game that doesn't exist he'll probably buy that uh, it's like a fucking collector's item it's like a first edition charizard or something that is so banking fees not surprisingly this include fees paid to our bank totals over 2600 over the three years and uh, was the third lowest cost cool business and office software coming in just under the top 20 <laughs> It's like he's doing a fucking music show or something. Coming in at t just under the top 20 is Pearl Jam with some song that I don't know. Uh, 23,500 business and office software includes any software licenses used for day-to-day -day business. In particular, Microsoft 365 subscriptions and office licenses. Our Slack licenses and Dropbox. Had we continued to work remotely in 2020, it no doubt would have included Zoom licenses as well, but didn't. Um, 
seems like a crazy amount of money to pay for licensing but i guess that's just a thing that exists convention costs while this one is listed as an average over three years i can confidently say that all 40k of the costs were accumulated in 2017 as that was the last year we went to a convention which was in pax east and pax west and the costs included payments to com convention organizers shipping rented media equipment and things like that if it was a cost required to attend the show aside from travel it's included in this category note that because we attended both pax east and west we spent about 20k per pax to attend given the higher cost of shipping to boston it may lean slightly towards pax east as the most expensive customer support software fresh desk and fresh works comes out to 2k per year note that they did employ someone on staff to be our customer service lead so don't assume that's the only cost associated with customer service great education and training one of the most significant jobs of the ceo is to help foster and grow the skills of your employees to that end subbound studios paid for an, almost any continued education request by the employees that included books courses from udemy uh, plural site subscriptions and even gdc passes to attend classes how much was this in total it was it was 7.3 grand a year on average apparently so employee salaries this is uh, maybe this will be the interesting section not surprisingly in an industry driven by intellectual property and creative talent employee salaries are the highest cost coming in at just over 1 million per year 3.5 million total for 2017 2018 and 2019 while i labeled it salaries in the table the category includes only the net take-home pay of the employees including myself social security medicare and income tax are all under the employment taxes category with an average of 17 employees 3.5 mil is take-home pay of just uh, of 68k per employee per year that's on the low end of the industry industry average but with standards based within the studio again this is this is why they struggle to to attract talent to the studio you can't they they literally were i think it was bellevue in washington where the studio is located and again i'm fairly sure valve valve's main office is like across the street basically so you're if you're paying somebody 68 grand uh, again this is average so some people are going to be on the lower end some people are on the higher and maybe they were offering 100k or something uh you're just not attracting somebody who's who's gonna do what you need or want them to do i used the 2014 game developer salary survey to develop our salaries after adjusting them for our region then i modified the wages further by increasing them by three percent per year for inflation from where that was published finally i broke the salaries into tiers for junior associate senior and principal titles while i know some companies have a policy of not sharing their salaries with others i always felt that people largely left the company because they felt taken advantage of i never wanted my employees to feel that way so while i never shared their salaries with others i made it clear upon hiring them that they were free to discuss their pay and talk to me if they needed clarification on why their income was what it was while on that section i wanted to quickly point out of the roughly 3.5 million dollars paid to employees in salary exactly 288,000 of that was paid to me from 2017 through 2019 as my salary uh, to save you the math that's an average of $96,000 per year, less than I took home as a software engineer. Additionally, if you were to calculate the averages, you'd find that my pay was 8.2% of the total. With 17 employees, my allotment would be 5.88% if we were all paid the same. As you can see, I was paid about 50% more than the average, and it's true that 96 k per year in take-home pay, I was generally not, but not always, the highest paid person in the studio. It makes sense to be uh it makes sense to be the highest paid as the ceo obviously uh, i mean nobody's gonna argue with that the issue is obviously they raised over eight million dollars and there's like 1.4 mil or something missing from this figure and that was what we knew about um based on on the website which i think the funding section was taken down at some stage uh, so i don't know what the exact number is of how much they raised maybe he'll bring it up in in here and obviously the thing here about the only distribution of 77k um at which is average per year so who did that go to i guess he'll bring it up here employment taxes this includes all the federal withholding paid to the irs such as withhold income tax who cares we know about taxes they exist you should pay them food and entertainment while only about 11k over three years this category is essential for the business this fund was used to pay for morale events such as company picnics and parties company lunches during crunch times paying for candidate lunches when people came for interviews and paying for coffee or lunch during off-site business meetings it's not much 
it wasn't a significant portion of our spending but it's sometimes important to bring the team together yeah as we can see it was incredibly important it really really did well furniture while most of our furniture costs was accumulating in 2016 we paid for a couple of employees to get a sit stand convertible desk in 2017 and 19 and again in early 2020 the health of your employees can't be overstated true uh, general liability insurance who cares health insurance premium who cares hiring expenses hiring is expensive um so they basically spent over 20k to recruit interview and hire candidates hosting and registration fees yeah web stuff we know independent contractors uh, while most of our ICs were in 2016 and 2020 most of the uh, independent contractors we had about 90k in contractor fees from 2017 to 19 and these fees were primarily for animators who worked remotely part-time using their hardware and resources set their hours and freely took on other clients nothing beats independent contractors for short-term projects and flexibility although there's often an overhead cost to managing them uh, for every few remote contractors you use assume you'll need someone internal to oversee the quality of their work yeah not wrong so internet yep business have to pay for internet access i don't know why the fuck you're saying that generally it's slower speeds than you can get for residential service service and three times ex as expensive but it's reliable mostly i didn't know uh, i obviously knew that there's like enterprise internet for for businesses but i didn't know it was slower and i didn't know it was that much more expensive that's fucking madness especially considering if you're in a fairly built up area nowadays i'm fairly sure residential internet would be enough for an office of 17 people like you can get one gig internet now for like 60 dollars in in the uk uh, so i don't know how that wouldn't be uh, good enough but but again america's uh, weird with with their internet right I, I always hear how you either live in an area that has great internet and it's relatively cheap or you live somewhere where you you just have internet from fucking 30 years ago so maybe maybe that was one of those areas considering valve's office is there i wouldn't imagine so but who knows loan payments in addition to crowdfunding we brought in from 2016 to 19 and the money i contributed to the company i also obtained business loans to buffer us in the months we had little crowdfunding like an individual a business must repay its lenders regularly so i guess we don't even specifically know how much money um chronicles of Lyria had because they had loans as well which we we never knew about as far as i'm aware so then marketing and smm software this is basically just sending fucking spam emails out to people about the progress that you're not making and that costs them 12k per year to do office expenses this is a catch-all that includes the everyday costs of running the office it has purchases from amazon target home depot office depot and similar stores for keeping the office space stocked with dishes utensils stationery blah 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 office lease soulbound studios yeah it was in bellevue like i said um, they looked at different locations with a broker for a few weeks. It was the cheapest we could find that fit our space needs. It had one large open room for the team, a conference room, a room we could use for motion capture, an office for myself for calls and meetings, and a room we used for our live streams. We kept the office in until 2019 when the lease expired. At that point, the landlord would increase the rate for the same space, so we negotiated a move into the building next door with the same owner. We expanded our floor space by roughly 100% for only about 80% more than we were already paying, and only about 50% of what the new rate would have been. The new location had separate spaces for artists and programmers, more conference room for interviews and meetings, a larger motion capture studio with high ceilings, and more offices for the team leaders and producers. It also had an, a, a dedicated office for live streams removed from the rest of the studio, so it was quieter. Amazing. PC hardware. This is self-explanatory. Yes, it is. We won't go through it. They bought PCs, because if you work on a video game, probably need a PC. Production software. This is basically licenses for production things. Yeah, we get it. Professional services fees. Uh, even a small studio needs accounting and legal services. Like many small companies, we paid a third party for our accounting and federal tax filings. Yeah, super boring. Uh, research. As CEO, it was important to my team not just develop games, but also play them. He bought them games. Nice. This improved team morale and allowed us to do competitive research and prime our creativity. They all just sat and played World of Warcraft for fucking four years. That's a joke, obviously. Just joking. Uh, while it was only about $500 per year, I encouraged the employees to let the studio pay uh, for games or movies they wanted to experience that could inspire them to do better work. And inspire them, it did. Secure storage space. We're not a convention. All of our equipment crates, uh, extra monitors and shit were stored. Cool. 
software licenses. This was for things like MSDN, Adobe Suite, Autodesk software, substance tools, etc. Et State licenses and taxes. Again, who gives a fuck? Travel. This category includes the travel cost incurred by myself and other employees exclusively for business travel. This had airplane, hotel, Uber, bus and parking costs for travel to PAX East and any trips taken to meet with partners and associates. Now, ownership distribution. This is what I was waiting for. This one is perhaps the most difficult to explain. Okay. Yet, it is still the sixth most expensive item on the list. That's why I saved it for last. If you look at the list above, there's one category that you might expect to see, but have yet to see. Federal income taxes. Even though Soulbound Studio generated income, in the United States, organizations of certain types do not pay business and income taxes directly. Instead, sole proprietorships, partnerships, LLCs, and S-Corps have passed through taxation. This means the organization's owners, members, shareholders must individually pay taxes on their share of the company's taxable income. For example, suppose you're the sole owner of a hypothetical S-Corp that generates $10 million in taxable income for the year, but your salary is only 100 k In that case, you are still responsible for paying household income taxes as though your family earned the total amount. That puts an unfair tax burden on the owners of the organization. As a result, it's common for LLCs and S-Corps to pay their members and shareholders distributions to help cover the cost of income taxes they owe. That way, the company effectively pays its own income taxes rather than passing the burden on to its owners. The only withdrawals I ever made from Solbound Studios' bank account were for only distributions, and all distributions were immediately sent to the IRS. As you can see, I withdrew, on average, about 75k per year, which was sent to the IRS. More specifically, I received 233500 from 2017 to 19. In the interest of helping future business owners understand the startup costs of running a business, from 2015 to 2019, I deposited 477 k in capital contributions. And if you're keeping a scoreboard, I deposited 477 k and withdrew 233 k to pay taxes and paid myself on average around 120 k per year, less than I made as a software engineer before starting Soulbound Studios. Wait, didn't he just tell us he paid himself 92 k per year? Am I missing something? So wait, let's get this straight. So this four years here, right? 2015 to 2019. He showed three years where the average was 92K. Because he, he literally tells us here. That, no, 96K per year. But then, but then he's saying his average salary across the entire five years was 120K. So what was he paying him? I'm not going to do the math. But surely that means if his salary was 96k for three years and his average was 120k per year, then the first two years he didn't show the, the books for, well, he's not shown the books, must have been really fucking high. Am I, am I just losing my mind? I'm not good with numbers in the first place. It's why I'm not an accountant. I'm a fucking idiot on YouTube with a camera. Uh, but surely that's what makes sense, yeah? Someone can do the math and let me know uh, how much he must have been paying himself for the years he didn't show uh, to have been making average 120k across five years, but only show us three years where he was averaging 96k per year. Because obviously what I saw originally was uh, documents stating he was paying himself 200 grand a year, which I don't know if that's true, um, but that's what that's what I saw. So in addition, I worked without income for three quarters of 2016 and have since worked without payment from 2020 to the present. While my circumstances are unique, they are not unheard of. If you are starting a game company to get rich quick, you will be disappointed, unless you're in cryptocurrency, in which case, well, you're probably a little bit too late to jump on that bandwagon, but if you were four years ago, you could have just become a fucking hundreds of millions of dollars multimillionaire and designed and developed literally nothing other than being rich you've developed being rich lessons learned crowdfunding and policies and legislation <laughs> the law rewards based crowdfunding is still a relatively new way of raising capital nobody really does it in mmos anymore so it doesn't matter and the policies and legislation around it are still in flux different state and federal organizations view rewards based crowdfunding differently generally whichever way is least favorable to you for example the irs considers it income not investment because it isn't 
it's not investment. Uh, so despite the need to use it for ongoing product development, you'll give the IRS a non-trivial amount. Meanwhile, the United States Patent and Trademark Office doesn't view it as doing business. Uh, so you'll constantly renew your copyrights until your product ships, which will involve continued legal fees. Yeah, uh, people shouldn't ever consider Kickstarter or crowdfunding investment. I see people talking about things like Star Citizen all the time and say, I've invested. No, you haven't. You've given money to a company for a product. Uh, it's not going to appreciate in value. You're not doing it for it to appreciate in value. You don't own shares. You're not at the board. You don't get fucking financials sent to you. You are not an investor. It's not an investment. Nor is it when you buy things in a video game you enjoy. And not, please, let's stop using that term. The main takeaway here is, although rewards-based crowdfunding can seem like a great way to gain the capital you need to be to build a product, there are plenty of unexpected gotchas out there. I imagine, yeah, I, I can definitely see that would be the case because it's a nightmare sometimes doing um, non-standardized and normal things in general, like being a YouTuber. You also have a bunch of weird shit with it. So furthermore, while crowdfunding was initially developed as a way to kickstart product development, acting as a seed round of funding that enabled people to do things they couldn't otherwise have done, it's since changed into more of an advertising or supply chain tool, with many people waiting until they've already got a product to launch crowdfunding campaign, using the funds to pay for scale out like manufacturing or distribution. He's not wrong, this is literally how I've also talked about uh, Kickstarter for quite a while, actually a good point. So now it's used as less of a seed round and more like a Series A round of financing. Yeah, good comparison. I can't believe I'm repeatedly agreeing with Caspian, but he's he's 100% right on this. Uh, it's also one of the things that when you go on Kickstarter nowadays, people expect there to be a playable product um, because people don't want to kickstart anything anymore uh, because they've been burned too many times. And it makes sense as a consumer because if you actually invest in something you have way more legal protections and access to information than if you're just some you know schmuck giving money based on somebody's uh, trusty feelings or whatever on a website like kickstarter that literally says you know they're not even fucking obliged essentially to to deliver a product so on the one hand i wonder if the recent approach provides the same opportunities for innovation as the original intent no it doesn't uh, but obviously it's less risky so as consumers that's what we've veered towards to protect ourselves on the other hand uh, waiting for companies to have a completed product before crowdfunding offers less risk and affords more protection to backers yeah uh, so would i recommend rewards based crowdfunding to others no at least not as a seed round of financing it's one of those things where people think crowdfunding is amazing but it's probably not to run a business and also uh, if you have the option to get money from other people you probably would have done so i guess for most people it's not even an option it's their go-to uh, salaries are expensive but there are hidden costs associated with employment in particular payroll taxes and medical insurance as you'll see below the average cost per employee per year is about 40 percent 45 percent higher than their base salary the most significant contribution comes from employment taxes and health insurance premiums i'm not going to go through contractual versus res residual capital so this is fairly important because essentially what he's talking about is having liability insurance to, you know, uh, pay money out if they get sued, I think. Uh, they had one for the the building, obviously protect, protection for damaging it from the landlord. Often perception is more powerful than reality, especially in the games industry. True. And for better or worse in the United States, people can sue you for just about anything they can convince a lawyer to sue you over. You can pretty much do that in most places in the West, I think. But America is a very litigious uh, place. I, I think you hear of people being sued way more uh, by American companies in, in, a, and in America than many other places. According to the American rule, unless expressly stated otherwise, each party to a lawsuit must cover their own legal fees regardless of the outcome. That creates a situation where if there's a value in your company's IP that could benefit a lawyer and somebody has a grudge against you for perceived wrongdoings, shots fired, you can be sued into bankruptcy if you allow it. Professional liability offers some protection against this. Please don't do business without it. So the cost of not hiring. Wow, we're getting meta. The last point I wanted to make goes back to residual income and the cost of hiring. I mentioned before that when you're staring at a runway, the decision to hire more people could seem like negligence. That seems like more people you'd have to let go of, right? So basically, whenever somebody talks about runway in a business sense, they just mean how much tarmac do we have left uh, before we, you know, crash and burn. 
the analogy being if you run out of runway you're fucked but obviously you want to take off before the end of the runway uh take off would be releasing your product whatever it might be a video game in this example uh so runway you'd ideally want a fair buffer between you and the end and then constantly extend it by raising capital uh, a lot of the problem comes from like for instance a project i'm releasing a video on uh, this week on the main channel having a runway of like one to two months uh a lot of companies do things like that in in indie gaming and it's it's obviously pretty pretty bad especially with things like chronicles of Lyria, where at the end they had no fucking runway and they weren't telling anybody they were just hoping that somehow even though money money in was going down sentiment was not going up and they weren't they, they were in no position to release anything uh, and still they told nobody and kept you know taking in little bits of money that they could until they literally couldn't operate anymore in 2019 i joined an advisory board to become a better ceo and leader at one point i met with the chair to get advice on what to do in this circumstance i told the chair that i'd had difficulty finding programmers so i'd specifically hired designers who could act as technical designers and do some of the work a programmer could do should i continue relying on them since they have the skills or hire more programmers the chair had me estimate the percentage of time the technical designers did things a programmer could do he then pointed out that i was still paying for the programmers anyways it was just being paid to the designers instead true people who were objectively less effective at the role and were spending their time doing that instead of designing that was slowing down development and increasing the numbers of months needed to complete the project he reminded me that each month spent on the project was a month spent paying for everyone in the studio not just the additional programmer this is actually good advice so in doing so he pointed out that while i was afraid of hiring someone at the risk of shortening the runway i was prolonging the project resulting in higher overall costs yeah while i was succeeding in slowing down our progress toward the end of the runway i was slowing down our progress even more i hired another programmer the next month and two more technical designers to catch up on the design work i'd f allowed to fall behind so essentially what he's saying is what i've said the whole time it was just he, he just didn't know what the fuck he was doing and that's not even being mean at least i hope not because that's the case for most people when they get into something like this it's just obviously the public didn't know um that he didn't know what he was doing so they kept giving him money and then he was just wasting the money um by managing it poorly which is not a crime uh, as far as i'm aware you know it's it's just what happens it's one of those things where people fucked up by being naive enough to think somebody who'd never run a studio could run a studio and then just threw money at him to do so to create one of the most ambitious games you could possibly ever make uh, and then he couldn't do it because of course he couldn't like if you're still here thanks for reading this lengthy de dev blog hopefully you found it informative before i end i wanted to quickly wrap up by providing two other critical pieces of information which while they could have been calculated from the above information uh, i'm providing explicitly to help further all the business owners and make decisions average monthly cost so first given the above the average monthly cost for running soulbar studios from 2017 to 2020 uh, so he's changed it now to to 2020 instead of 2019 uh, a company with an average of 17 employees was 190 thousand dollars that fluctuated uh, monthly based on the number of employees we had the current lease and whether quarterly or annually taxes were due however if you're marked appropriately that month average should still give you everything you need to prepare for the highs and lows and then he's given us a breakdown of cost per per uh, average employee uh, the above table shows the costs uh, most likely to scale with additional employees the first column yeah we know below the table are two additional values the average cost per employee yeah 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 uh, finally by taking the average net payments to employees of 68k and adding back 50 percent of the employment taxes 25k you can see that the average salary per employee at soulbound studios was about 80k and if you read this far thank you for joining me if the above information provides uh, it proves valuable to even one or the current or even better future ceo in the game industry then it was more than worth the time it took to prepare and write it yeah i imagine this could be useful to some people again i would personally have seen preferred seeing it per yearly breakdown especially for the years where he says that it was only him and like two other people he says it would have pulled down the averages but there's no reason to have only shown averages unless there's something you don't want people seeing in my opinion it could it could be something completely you know just irrelevant it could be something completely innocent but obviously to me when you're showing three years and only averages and then i can see from the total value 
that there's like over a million dollars missing where you said there was like no employees essentially you and a couple other people and you weren't paying yourself but then you say you're averaging 96k for three years but your average over five was 120 uh, maybe this is just written poorly but i'd imagine a lawyer had to go over this so i don't know man i don't know if i'm missing something uh, somebody can let me know in the comments what it is if so and obviously i'll i'll uh, endeavor to to pin that comment um but yeah there we go that's another caspian dev blog some of these have been much more interesting than they have any any fucking reason to be uh at least they're not technical jargon anymore i just wish jeremy would post videos again and show us the game that he's he's developing and says he's going to be finished and released this year which you know running out of running out of time on that one but there we go thanks for watching uh twitch link in description patreon twitter x i guess uh, discord and suggest content you want me to cover all those things and see you next time peace